So now we have Michael uh, Tem who will be talking about their paper CGC monitor, uh, a vetting system for DARPA cyber brand traffic. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for sticking around for uh, the last uh, paper presentation anyway. I'm seeing a few more people have trickled in since breakfast. Uh, so I'm Tim and this is Mike, and uh, we both worked on the, the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge program for what, about three years. And um, that concluded um, just under two years ago now um, uh, at the, the DEF CON conference in uh, Las Vegas. So we wanted to, uh, it took a little bit to get through all of the uh, disclosure and, and vetting on the big system uh, processes for getting information out from the project, because this is sometimes the case with government work. Uh, but we wanted to talk about a little piece of the integrity system um, uh, that was, was sort of uh, forensically, uh, doing some forensics on the, uh, the submissions from the competitors. So, um, the overview slide that's sort of required the academic overview slide. I'm going to give some background on the, the CGC program itself and motivate the, the need for integrity. And I'm going to switch it over to Mike, who's going to go over uh, some of the details of the, the vetting system and um, broadly talk about uh, reverse execution. So, who's heard of uh, capture the flag contests? Yeah, and in, in the context of cybersecurity, right? And I, I guess how many people did the rodeo last night? About the same people, it looks like. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we won't spend too much time talking about CTF, but I do want to make the distinction of um, there's two broad classes of CTF, and, and the rodeo took one class, uh, went one direction last night with the Jeopardy board style, where you sort of choose your own adventure. Uh, you can pick the challenge if you're doing by picking the, the square or whatever the game board looks like. And there's a whole other class, uh, which is typically does attack defend, where um, the contestants are simultaneously trying to uh, defend some uh, information system while exploiting vulnerabilities in a similar system that the other contestants are operating. And often those are directly attached and uh, might happen over uh, traditional network sockets and TCP and things like that. Um, so um, in this context, it's a, a security-based actual flag, cybersecurity-based, right? It's not the, the game that, that kids are playing physically. It's not the first person shooter that's available on the, uh, the Xbox or the PlayStation or whatever. And typically, these puzzles are uh, involving demonstrating some level of proficiency in a particular skill set. So it might be like a forensics problem, it might be a reverse engineering problem, a number of security problem, crypto, uh, and so forth. Um, so there's different models for organizing how these contests actually work. So you, you might structure the contest to um, uh, try and uh, educate novice people to make them more experts. You might uh, structure it to uh, achieve particular learning objectives, and there's different ways to, to structure the contest itself. So there's sort of um, the, the game for the organizers is structuring the contest such that the participants are navigating the game in the, in the way that you want to demonstrate that level of efficiency. So these things are increasingly common. Ten years ago, there were there were only a handful of them. Uh, now you can. You basically participate in them uh, about every other week, and some of them have uh, serious prizes where if you were a skilled enough individual or team, you could basically make a living by winning these contests year round. Um, uh, so, and also, uh, I wanted to note that uh, today that the, the character CTF um, is sort of becoming more and more ambiguous, it almost just as the, means contest. <coughs> so I think DEF CON has like 27 CTFs coming weeks, and a lot of them don't fit into that classic mold of uh, sort of the Jeopardy style of the attack to them. Um, so the, the game flow, this is this is a, a specific um, type of CTF, and this is the one that applies to attack to them uh, CTF, and this is the one that applies to how the CGC uh, game work, so that has some like added context for the, the next slides. One thing that was particularly curious about or somewhat novel about the, the CGC design is that it was attack defend, but the attackers and defenders were not directly connected to each other. So in the, the old days, so to speak, the, uh, the different participants might literally be plugged into the same network switch, and you could more or less directly attack by, by opening just summons, right? You just connect to them and, and try and uh, exploit a vulnerability. 
and CTC and in, in a few other contexts, it's a, a broker game. So all of the game moves, so to speak, are mediated by some central party. In our case, it was the, the competition infrastructure, which was a, a quite a large um, set of hardware and software, which we'll talk a little bit about. We'll tell you about the pieces that are interesting for, for the forensics harness. And um, this is, a, again, this is a huge uh, endeavor by many people over three years. So if you're, we're glossing over a part that was interesting to you, like feel free to grab us and ask us about it. Or, it was pretty exciting work and we're pretty enthusiastic to talk about it. So it was a broker game. So um, uh, the infrastructure mediates everything. There's an API. Um, part of the, the CGC, I get a little ahead of myself, but part of the CGC um, uh, mission was, uh, was autonomy. So the APIs were designed to be run without humans uh, in the interface. So all the interfaces were uh, machine readable and designed to be uh, used by machines. And roughly, the, the downloading software that was meant to be analyzed and then uploading software that was um, affecting the, the different offensive and defensive moves they could make in the game. So these are modified replacement brains. Um, to give you a little bit more insight into what the competition infrastructure looked like on the, the inside, so not what the competitor was controlling, but what the competitor was um, affecting in their, in their moves and their uploads. We had different physical hosts on the infrastructure side uh, for each team. So each team had uh, a set of hosts depicted here um, allocated for them on the, the infrastructure racks. And uh, the, the easiest one to start with is the defended host uh, off to the uh, your right hand side. And this is where the vulnerable software runs. So this is all binary software. We call them challenge binaries. And um, these are the services that have the, the known vulnerabilities in them that have to be uh, detected and then taken advantage of and also to, uh, modified to be defended so that the other participants can take advantage of it on your defended host. So we, the infrastructure team, uh, manage this uh, and uh, the moves are um, uh, uploaded by the, uh, by the participants and then we place the, um, the modified binaries um, in a running state on the defended host. Uh, so since nothing can interact directly, we need a way to exercise the uh, challenge binaries as they go through their different types of behavior. So if you think about a web server, you need to have the different HTTP requests coming into the web server and exercising the different features of the web server. So this sort of benign or expected behavior is done by the polar in your upper left, the guy with the little checkbox. So he's sort of making sure that all of the functionality that's expected of that service are still true, so exercising all the different aspects of the web server, so to speak. Um, and then, because this is a broker game, the, uh, the proof of vulnerability, uh, which you might call an attack against the vulnerability, um, it can't be launched directly by a participant. So these, again, are uploaded to this broker interface, and then they're launched on behalf of the participant by the competition infrastructure. So we have a dedicated uh, machine down here called the POV machine, and uh, those different colored boxes are indicating different um, participants that have uh, placed a move to launch an attack against uh, this particular the, the set of host, hosts uh, on this slide for this participant. So uh, here are three different um, uh, opponents have uh, registered their intent to launch a proof of vulnerability against this defended host. So all of the polls, the benign interactions, and the POVs, the attempts at proving vulnerability of the attacks uh, are sent towards the defended host, and that's all through a, um, a network IDS. So the, um, everything is mediated through the IDS, and the, um, the participant that is associated with this defended host has an opportunity to not only replace the, um, the services, but also introduce intrusion detection rules network style, smart style rules um, to, um, to mitigate attacks. So then in addition, the one other piece on this slide um, is that in addition to the interface that allows you to change the software in the game, there's also a, a, a tap, like a mirror core feed, that comes from the IDS that goes to the CRS. So all of the, um, all of the participants get two cables, a bi-directional API cable, and then a unidirectional tap uh, from the uh, IDS. So, uh, so what does it look like? Well, CTF-wise, um, if anybody watches the uh, Mr. Robot stuff, there was an episode where they went through and they kind of depicted this, this party-like environment with a, with a rodeo-style uh, uh, 
uh, Jeopardy style game board at the end. Um, it looks like this. It's not the most, uh, C CTF is not the most um, uh, spectator friendly sport. You see a lot of people like looking at uh, computers just working uh, at their keyboard. And so you think like, well, what is the Hollywood representation? Well, it looks a lot like this, what it actually looks like in real life. So there is a little bit of, uh, quite a bit of truth to reality there. So if you look at DEF CON just a few years ago, um, got a picture from DEF CON 2016, and you can go all the way back to like 2012, like pretty much looks the same. I mean, if you're, you're, it's all in the cyber realm, it's all people hunkering over uh, keyboards much as you are uh, right now. So the, the DEF CON one is one of the longest running contests in this space, and it's uh, often called the World Series or the Super Bowl of, of CTF. Um, right, so, it's just a picture. so then to anchor that back into CGC, right? So this is like the, the dark funded program, the Cyber Grand Challenge. Well, if you if you boil it down to just a small phrase, the, the research question was, could you could you automate all of that? Right? Like you're, you're typically saying that this is human driven, you're trying to exercise specific subject matter expertise in crypto, in forensics, in reverse engineering. So uh, DARPA likes to automate things, they like to build robots, they like to make large technology small, right? So could a purpose-built computer actually play in this, this sort of Super Bowl of CPS? So if we distill that down, you need autonomous binary analysis, patching, vulnerability discovery, uh, service resiliency, and uh, because there's an IDS to So if we're going through the pictures and saying what it looked like, so this is what CGC ended up looking like. So instead of a bunch of um, hackers wearing black t-shirts and a computer uh, that sitting at keyboards, uh, because it's autonomous, we have racks of machines that are sitting there like doing the things that the humans used to do. So it's, it's sort of even less spectator friendly, right? Like I you don't even have some person sitting at a keyboard, you just have a rack that you are taking on faith that is, is making similar actions to what used to happen. Uh, but even so, this, this isn't a rendering. This kind of looks like an artistic rendering. This is like a real picture. It's very uh, colorful and, and had, you know, saturated kind of environment. Uh, but much like the, uh, much like a golf game or whatever, you, there was, it was very long running, but the last portion of the, the event was, was live streamed and done as a live event uh, in Las Vegas. So there were uh, crowds and, you take this spectator unfriendly uh, environment of having uh, the racks and you try and find ways to, uh, to engage the audience um, with visualizations and explanations and commentators and so forth. And, uh, it was quite the event. Um, so uh, again, it was three years. There were uh, qualifiers that were final. Uh, there was the, the final event is the one that we're talking about the most, which is where the, seat, the forensics harness uh, came into play. And you can see that there were a hundred um, qualified applicants down to seven finalists. So right from the beginning, from, the, from, from more than three years before the final event, there were uh, critical um, uh, concerns about uh, the integrity of the game. Uh, integrity is one of the So they wanted it to be very repeatable. So there were great lengths into um, making, uh, increasing the determinism of different aspects of the uh, uh, architecture and the implementation of the game. Uh, and then skipping down to the bottom bullet, well, we wanted to also make lots of related data sets available to continue research in, uh, in the field. So not only the, the different purposes of corpora uh, of binaries and the results from the event itself, uh, but the, the, the parts of places where there were, where we couldn't have high determinism, we wanted to report so that um, the event can be replicated, the results can be replicated. And then crucial to uh, today's presentation was the competition integrity. Um, so we have lots of um, uh, inputs from competitors, and these competitors are, are some of the best uh, um, hackers, and, and what, they, what they do are, are subvert CTO systems and try and win at all costs, right? So um, there's a, a lot of concern uh, both from who the participants are, and then also the, the purse and the, um, the prize money at, at stake. So there was a little under seven million dollars at stake, and um, and seven million dollars is enough, but it's also seven million dollars that is coming from the United States government, right? So there's like this additional layer of uh, 
um, sort of need for integrity and the desire to not be subverted. Um, so this is a pretty dense slide, but um, I wanted to um, highlight the, the, the lengths that we were going to in, in different aspects of the game, which will some kind of motivate um, uh, some of the, the intensity to the forensics harness. But, uh, but the randomness, we even limited randomness available to, uh, to user space so that uh, people couldn't, uh, we needed the, the reproducibility so we couldn't have uh, the, the randomness that you might get from a typical machine. But we also couldn't let people uh, predict uh, what was going to happen in any, in any particular space so that they could try and gain the system. So we went to, to lengths such as using a, a deterministic pseudorandom number generator uh, to, um, to, to see the different aspects of randomness available in user space. Uh, but the seeding for that um, couldn't be controlled by DARPA, who could then predict the outcome of the game. It couldn't be controlled by the unique participants. So we, we mixed uh, inputs from all the different participants and from DARPA, and we committed to the seeds ahead of time. We committed to the schedule of uh, CD release ahead of time, and, and tried to um, uh, really uh, take all the, the, the the different ways that you could gain the, the system and give yourself advantage and take it away while still while still maintaining uh, the repeatability aspect so that people could uh, redo experiments. Uh, we, we even committed to kernel versions years in advance, which uh, months and months in advance, uh, which is really annoying when you're trying to keep up with security updates. You have to backport patches. Uh, the reason we committed to the kernel the primary reason was for supply chain. Right. Could, could people actually manipulate the game by subverting the entire infrastructure by, doing, uh, by uh, committing something or understanding some vulnerability in a, in a kernel uh, after the, uh, the announcement of the competition but before the competition was ever done? We designed a, an architecture that only had seven system calls, so the environment is very reduced compared to a modern operating system that would have hundreds of system calls. Um, and uh, even in that case, all of our, our public systems were released on a BSD, or sorry, were released on a, a Linux-based 32-bit kernel, and our production systems are on a 64-bit FreeBSD kernel. Um, so think about all the complexities of making those two systems appear the same from user space. Like anybody that's gone into the OS internals, there's a, a, a huge lift in making those appear uh, identical um, to uh, user space software. Uh, and then, uh, again, just driving home the, the lengths towards integrity, we had a physical air gap, so a uh, lifted stage off the floor, so you uh, didn't have you know, additional network cables um, going into the different uh, competitor machines. This was fully autonomous, so when the game started, all the designers of the software uh, had to just step back and watch, and uh, we're, we're not allowed to manipulate anything. You couldn't restart services, you couldn't change software. It was completely hands-off, so there was a physical air gap. Uh, power and cooling went through this transparent uh, bridge thing uh, to, to try and demonstrate that there was really nothing crossing the air gap. For, for production needs, the, the one thing that did cross the air gap was uh, one direct, a unidirectional robot that took optical media from the inside and dropped it on the outside. Um, expensive contractor project. Uh, and uh, so competitors had to be autonomous, but, um, but organizers didn't. So uh, we, uh, but organizers had to uh, observe air gap rules. So uh, as we went in and out of refereeing the system uh, during uh, the event, uh, you know, cell phones couldn't go in and out, no wireless connectivity, a lot of dedicated and analysis machines on the inside, and so forth. Um, so now I'm going to uh, dive a little deeper into the specific uh, integrity control for the, uh, the CGC monitor, the forensic harness. Hi, uh, and I'm Mike Thompson. I'm from the Nate Post Graduate School, and this is what I've worked out primarily over those three years. So our goal was to vet all the competitor software that we got before it ran on, or as it was running on the uh, competition infrastructure. Uh, so in order to do that, we simulated or duplicated the entire CGC infrastructure on Civics full system simulator. So we simulated the game and used that to vet the software. Uh, the simulation included multiple components. All of the game services, the operating system that Tim described, that was all simulated. Um, and so we monitored the operating system for execution and data integrity while the software, the computer supply software was running. And we used a high fidelity x86 model from uh, Intel in order to sort of anchor the simulation. 
we built the monitor on Simix primarily using breakpoints and callbacks. So if you work with uh, dynamic, dynamic virtual machine in, in, uh, introspection, you uh, might understand some of those challenges. None of the monitoring functions were running on the system itself. Uh, in order to achieve this, we built a custom operating system awareness you know, based on the internals of the operating systems, and we had to do that for both 32-bit and 64-bit versions of Linux and FreeBSD. And so we even had simulations running with uh, heterogeneous mixes of those. And during the uh, competition, all of that was running on 32 blade servers, which we ran multiple instances of the simulated CDC infrastructure so that we could vet all of those competitors like software submissions. So those submissions included the proofs of vulnerabilities that Tim described, the replacement challenge binaries, and the filters that the competitors uh, issued for their IDSs. So while any of those things were scheduled for execution on the kernel, we monitored the kernel uh, for things like the pop, and that would be execution of return instructions that don't appear to follow calls. Uh, we monitor for modification of the kernel and page tables, uh, modification of user credentials, such as trying to change a user ID <coughs> to maybe zero, and uh, execution of any code that didn't have any business executing while a particular um, competitor submission was running. So all of those things were done uh, uh, during the game to look for um, attempts to subvert the infrastructure. We also, as we were doing this, had the ability to generate uh, artifacts while we were monitoring. So of course, any uh, events that were anomalous we would report. We could also uh, create full execution traces that included data references, uh, system call logs of everything that happened during the game. Uh, we could uh, generate records for successful proofs of vulnerabilities, that is, successful exploits within the game, instances of ROP or stack execution by the actual applications, which is what they were trying to do and what we were expecting to see. Uh, we could record that. And of course, there are services, services. So that's sort of an overview of the monitoring side. Uh, needless to say, we didn't uh, discover anybody trying to subvert the infrastructure. But another component that we built into this simulator was the ability to actually look at the successful exploits and try to understand uh, what bugs were being exploited. And so this was uh, sort of my favorite part of the this part of the project, and that allowed me to run a computer backwards in order to figure out what the exploits were. So to put it in the context of a natural real world analogy where you have a fuzzer that has managed to generate a crash of input for some service, and so you know, you've got this output from the fuzzer, you know it crashes the service, and maybe you know it gives you control of the IP. That tells you precisely nothing, well, almost nothing about the actual bug that you're <coughs> Uh, CGC demonstrated quite well that you can uh, exploit a bug in the service without really understanding what that bug is or where the bug is. Uh, in CGC, the competitors found 20 vulnerabilities in 82 of the challenge sets that we uh, gave them to work on. But the question was, what was the flaws? Whether they were actually been exploiting the intended flaws that the authors put into the software. So if you looked at the uh, patches that the competitors issued against those Petflog software, that really wouldn't tell you anything about the actual bug that was being exploited because the patches themselves were generic in nature. They didn't really uh, fix the bugs. So in order to answer this question, we uh, re-instrumented the simulator to analyze the applications as opposed to watching the operating system. And what this gave us was the ability to have an analyst start up a session and that session would then uh, pause when something interesting happened, like a proof of vulnerability. The analyst could then reverse execution to help him or her understand what the nature of the bug was. And to do that, we combined a IDA Pro debugger and used that as a front end to our CGC monitor, which was built on a Simix full system simulator. So imagine you've got a IDA Pro session that you're running. It looks just like any IDA uh, debugger session. And in this case, uh, you can't see it, but uh, the, I'm looking at a function call pointer in which I know that, say, the uh, content of ECX is corrupt. And I'm interested at this point in knowing where that value came from, what's the provenance of the, that corrupt uh, register. So reverse execution becomes very helpful to answer that question. So I can actually run backwards to start answering that question using functions that we built into an IFO plugin. 
So our IDAPRO client includes uh, the usual sort of debugger functions, but in reverse. And so I can say, run backwards, do you hit an breakpoint? I can say things like, uh, step backwards over the current function or into the current function. I can put the cursor somewhere in the, in the code and say, run backwards to that. I can say, run backwards until this particular register has been modified back in time. Um, I can set and jump around to bookmarks, interesting places in the execution. And I can uh, semi-automate backtracing of the uh, data. So if I'm interested in the providence of uh, content of memory, I can say run backwards and generate bookmarks until you find the source of that particular data. So I'll quickly look at the uh, subsystem that makes this happen. You, you're interacting with the IDA Pro. Uh, say you want to jump backwards to where that, that arrow is up at the top. The uh, client then is going to send over to the CGC monitor using uh, sort of an out of band uh, send monitor command. It's going to send the, the address to where I want to go backwards to. The CGC monitor then is going to call down to the, the Civics engine and say, hey, the next time you stop, for whatever reason, come to this callback. I tell it where to break, and then I tell it to run, and it then starts running backwards, uh, executing backwards, or at least looking like it's executing backwards, until it gets to some breakpoint. It might be the breakpoint I set, it might have been some other breakpoint, because of course I'm debugging, I want it to run until it hits a breakpoint. When it hits a breakpoint, it stops, and tells my IDA client at this point that it's stopped, uh, and where it is stopped. The interesting thing here is that IDA Pro, up until this point, hasn't been involved in that particular sequence. It doesn't know where it is right now. So I then call down into IDA Pro and I say, hey, set a breakpoint at this address. And I tell it to set the breakpoint at what happens, what I know is the current address. And so it then talks using its normal debugger interface to the uh, debug server and says, run to this breakpoint. And the server says, oh, yeah, I'm already there. OK, I'm there. I'm done. I, I ran to your breakpoint. It is now happy and it queries the server in order to get its registers and its memory update. So now from the user's perspective, IDA has run backwards and it now knows the current system state. So I can look at register content, memory content, and such. So how do we get this reverse execution? How does Simix provide that, that illusion? Uh, well, it's very resource intensive. What it does is as you're running forward, it records a series of micro checkpoints. <laughs> And then it references those checkpoints during reverse execution, essentially iterating over each one, then running forward until it hits a breakpoint. And it keeps doing that until it decides that it has hit the most recent breakpoint of interest. Um, the challenge, though, is that that progression of running backwards isn't strictly serial. So you're going to hit a lot of breakpoints that you wouldn't normally hit. So if you have associated callbacks with those breakpoints, you're going to get a lot of noise and a lot of garbage, so you can't really use those uh, callbacks when you're running backwards. So to review uh, what we found, we used that, that harness in order to analyze all of the uh, successful POVs in the, the event. Um, of 82 challenge sets, there were 109 intended vulnerabilities built into the services. 20 of those had working POVs in the final event, so the competitors found 20 um, exploits. Turns out that half of those working POVs were not even what the author intended. Uh, six were actually bugs that were unknown to the author that they put in. Two of the services were exploited by the same bug. It happened to be a shared library that had an unintended exploit in it. Uh, four of the uh, bugs were the intended bug, but they were exploited in a way that the author did not intend. And then all of the exploits within the game, that is everything that everybody found, was basically the same. They all found the same bug and exploited it the same way. Uh, the tool was also automatic, uh, able to generate automatic back traces of data. So this is uh, up as part of the CGC corpus that's online. You can see the back traces that this uh, reverse, uh, reverse execution generated. So you'll see the sources of corrupt, corrupt uh, memory locations and call registers, that sort of thing. Uh, in the future, what we'd like to do is extend this tool to more general execution environments. Uh, as Tim described, the decree environment that the game ran on had uh, only seven system calls. We'd like to expand it for a full set. And we'd like to make the tool as sort of a, uh, a service so that somebody sitting out with IDA Pro on a workstation can, can 
connect to the service and uh, run software backwards to help find the bugs. The monitor in our analysis is up on GitHub at these links. Um, the source for the monitor is there, but you would have to bring your own um, CIMICs. So I'd like to close by noting that the U.S. government has a couple hundred uh, copies, uh, unused copies of licenses to use this CIMICs-based monitor. Uh, those are available on a number of repurposed uh, supercomputers, the CGC, or the DARPA distributed after the competition. And so I'd like to find uh, government people who might be interested in locating those and setting up, uh, you know, simics based uh, monitoring. Uh, questions? Are there any questions? So I, I thought that this was one of the more interesting papers that I've, that I've read because it's so unique. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how this might be useful outside of the challenge? Like, is it generally useful, or is this just something, in your opinion, that it was a really cool way of solving this one problem? Well, I think the I think the analyst tool is generally useful from the perspective of well, two perspectives. The most useful one is helping uh, train people who are going to do reverse engineering that need to understand and comprehend what's happening to a application while it's being exploited. So if you think about bringing up item pro and trying to analyze what the vulnerable software is doing, if you have the ability to run backwards on your, you know, to answer questions that you have in your own mind, I think it gives you the ability to much better comprehend what's happening. So from a training and a um, education perspective, I think it's a useful tool. I think the automated backtracing is also very helpful in actually identifying the bug, that old problem of, yeah, I can exploit that thing, but can I patch it? Can I figure out what the bug is? Uh, I think it's uh, a good contribution to the field of being able to automate the process of actually identifying the true bug so I can patch it. Uh, the Docker released a kind of an after action something within the last year. It's quite long, but it's worth watching. And they, they also showed sort of a, they used a visualization that kind of showed the exploits. Is that related to this at all, or is that a different project? Uh, it's a different project. Uh, that project didn't really show what was happening. It showed what it looked like, what was happening, but you couldn't like say where if something happened, see a water overflow, see that it, somebody just you know, trashed it, a call there. Uh, so yeah, this was separate. Different, different project, and they actually when I came to their visualization data, uh, sort of completely different path. So they were they were outside their net, so they were operating the data that came off of those optical disks. So they were um, they knew the the outcomes, uh, so like how scores were generated, whether uh, proof of vulnerabilities were successful or not, and the, the team pairings and things like that. But when it came to execution traits, that was all done in a uh, competing system, so to speak. They, they weren't interlocked. For <laughs> All right, so we've, uh, do you have anything to say? So after Elizabeth talks, we have a break until 10.45. as we go into the break. Uh, the most important one, if you want to be part of the Works in Progress,